Well, this morning, we ask and answer the question, why am I here? And more than any other question in human existence, this is the question that's been asked the most. It's been asked and answered in every civilization, in every time frame in history. In fact, it's such an urgent and a popular question that one of the best-selling books of all time, The Purpose Driven Life, was written to answer it. Rick Warren in that book actually came up with five purposes to answer that question. The Westminster Catechism, a document written in the 1650s to bring the Church of England and the Church of Scotland together, it was part of a kind of a revival of catechisms of the day, asked famously the question, what is the chief end of man? And in the 1650s, they decided that, the, that man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Some of you may have heard that. And that sounds like it should settle the question, except that we keep asking it. Why am I here? Of all the questions in this series, where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? This is the question that I personally struggled with the most in the past. And so in preparing for this message, I've actually gone through several different approaches because this is a big and important question. I actually began earlier this week with several columns and kind of a similar approach to last week. I had a whiteboard and all kinds of stuff. But where last week was really largely existential, I think that most of you are probably where I was. You weren't just asking a question about life. I mean, you are, but a question really about your own personal fit in life. And so this morning, we're going to take a little bit of a different approach. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to cover the purpose of life. I'm going to give you a person in the Bible to look at. We're going to look at a passage together that you can kind of hold on to. I'm going to give you a process for discovering your own fit and then some principles that are attached to the question. Purpose, person, passage, process, and principle. Of course they're all P's, I'm a pastor. <laughs> and I'm gonna try and cover it in roughly 30 minutes. So strap in. Why am I here? Let's find out together. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and verses 10 through 20. 10 verses, a passage that we're gonna hold on to. 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and verses 10 through 20. We're going to launch from this passage and we're going to return to this passage and get into it pretty deeply. Now, in your supplemental notes, uh, there are two other references, and these are two large supplemental passages. So you're going to want to write the main reference down somewhere. This isn't listed in your notes. So 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and verses 10 through 20. Some of you are massive note takers and you want to get the structure. So I'll give the piece to you one more time. Purpose, person, passage, process, and then principles. Okay? 1 Chronicles chapter 29, 10 verses. Won't you stand with me in honor of God's word? Therefore David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I, and what is my people, that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, and of your own we have given you. We are strangers before you, and sojourners, I'd circle the word sojourners, as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow. There is no abiding. O Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. I know, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things, and now I have seen your people who are present here, offering freely and joyously to you. O oh Lord, 
the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts toward you. Grant to Solomon, my son, a whole heart, that he may keep your commandments, your testimonies, and your statutes, performing all, and that he may build the palace for which I've made provision. Then David said to all the assembly, Bless the Lord your God. And all the assembly blessed the Lord, the God of their fathers, and bowed their heads and paid homage to the Lord and to the king. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that your spirit would rule this place. We read from the Old Testament and we think because it was such a long time ago that somehow it's not pertinent to us today. But Father God, this is really the prayer of our hearts that you, O Lord, reign in the heavens and in the earth. You see all things and to you belongs all the glory and the power and the majesty. And so we pray, Father, that as you reign and you rule, that your spirit would exhale upon our lives and that we would inhale his life in your son's name amen you may be seated well the subject of our text is David David is leading a blessing of materials for the building of the temple. We're going to return to David in just a few moments. So the first thing I want to cover this morning is purpose. Purpose. There's really two quick passages of scripture that we need to get into to get us into the conversation. The first is from Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 21. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. The second passage is Proverbs 20 and verse 5. The purpose in a man's heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. We're going to be a people of understanding this morning, and we have to address some of the existential issues that does come with purpose. Um, There's a lot of opinions when it comes to this question, uh, which really is to say a different way, what is the meaning of life? H.G. Wells, who was a famous historian and philosopher, said toward the end of his life at age 61, I have no peace. All life is at the end of the tether. The literary genius Thoreau said, most men live lives of quiet desperation. Shakespeare in Macbeth wrote, life is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Pretty uplifting stuff, right? It's kind of like Alice in uh, the work Alice in Wonderland in a conversation between her and the, Chesh- and the Cheshire cat. And Alice asked, would you tell me please which way I ought to go from here? Well, that depends a good deal on where you want to go, said the cat. I don't much care where, said Alice. Then it doesn't matter which way you go, said the cat. And that's the conclusion that's easy to get to if we miss this answer. Now, there are five ways to answer this question of purpose. These are me, others, ideals, family, and God. Now, some of you are going to want to write these down because I don't have columns and no whiteboard. I'm not going to go in depth through them all because we've still got the person, the passage, the process, and the principles to get to. Briefly then, let me just go through these first purposes. Uh, The very first answer humanity has come up with to the question, why am I here, is me. So you stick your thumb out, you point it to your chest, it's me. It's to make myself happy. Now, we call this hedonism. Hedonism is the pursuit of pleasure. The focal point of the pursuit of pleasure is me. It's all about my needs and my wants. It's about what makes me happy. Last week, we talked about determinism. In an interview with Oxford University, Ricky Gervais, who's a famous atheist, said that in a world without God, the best conclusion you can come to is to do what's best for yourself. And his commentary, his uh, comedy in society, is really based on that observation that everybody wants to be in the spotlight. Everybody wants to do what's best for them. Now, the challenge with hedonism is twofold. One, 
what makes you happy is sometimes in direct conflict with what makes someone else happy. I mean, if one woman is happy stealing another wife's husband, then there's a serious conflict of interest. If I'm happy stealing your money, that might give me meaning, but it comes at a cost to everyone else around me. Number two, it's empty. Hedonism is empty. Van Halen saying, I don't know what I've been living on, but it's not enough to fill me up. Ralph Barton, one of the world's leading cartoonists, pinned a note to his pillow, and here's what the note said. He put this down shortly before he committed suicide. He said this, I've had few difficulties, many friends, great successes. I've gone from wife to wife, from house to house, visited great countries of the world, but I am fed up inventing devices to fill up 24 hours of the day. See, there's only so many vacations that you can go on before life starts to feel pretty meaningless. And you start wondering why in the world you're taking up everybody else's airspace. You know that U.S. suicides have reached a 30-year high? You know the number one group of people that suicides are in right now? Baby, retired baby boomer men. In fact, they're 60% more likely than their fathers were to commit suicide. Why? Well, they're boomers. For their whole lives, it was about them. The boomers had all eyes on them. They created a whole marketing category for themselves. They marched in the streets against the man, man. And then they went through the decade of the 80s, began to live for themselves. And these guys have been planning for retirement. I'm getting everything that I want. I'm going to step into that moment. This is what I've been building for. They got there. They had everything their heart could desire. And guess what? It wasn't enough. And so they're taking their own lives. It's meaningless. The second answer humanity has come up with for the question, why am I, am I here, is for others. So if the first one is me, the second one is you. That makes sense. Another way to look at this is people who live for society. Men, you're just here to make society a better place. Just advance the community around you. Now, this is called altruism. It's about living for others. There was a German philosopher by the name of Immanuel Kant who popularized this idea with Kantonian ethics, which basically states that the supreme good in life is not to subordinate others. Uh, this is based really on the golden rule of do unto others as you would have done to yourself. In popular terms, here's how you hear it expressed on talk shows. Uh, if it's not hurting anyone else, it's okay to do it. Now, there's three problems here. The first is that the golden rule that Jesus set, and it is his golden rule, but it's set within the context of the greatest commandment, which is to love the Lord your God holy. You can't get to the second unless you get to the first. Number two, if I treated everyone as I would want to be treated, and I'm a masochist, which means I get, in my brokenness, I get uh, pleasure from pain, then I got no problem inflicting pain on other people. Number three, there's some cultural problems to the logic, which impacts everybody from Hawaiians to 14-year-old girls on Snapchat. You know, for thousands of years, the Polynesian peoples ate their enemies, and they did it for the mojo. If, uh, if I was to walk up to a Maori tribesman, this is a native New Zealander po uh, Polynesian tribe, and uh, we know this because we actually have records of missionaries going up to these tribesmen and asking them the question, don't you want to treat your enemies the way that you would want to be treated? Here was their answer. Well, I am. If they can defeat me, then they're entitled to my mojo. More power to them. If you were to ask a 14-year-old girl if bullying someone on social media is something she would want to have happen to her, she would probably say, well, no, but it wouldn't happen to me because I'm stronger than the girl that I'm bullying. So the question becomes, upon what do you define what is good for society? If it's your culturally moral preferences, then those will change over time. Your morality has to be based on more than your preferences. This is how I think I should be treated. The third answer to the question, why am I here, is ideals. It's People are romantics, right? It's kind of their way of giving the larger finger to the status quo. 
A lot of isms kind of fall under this category. Communism, capitalism, anarchism. A lot of ideals like freedom, braveheart, freedom, right? And all of that stuff and love. All of that stuff, those are great ideals. And by the way, I'm a romantic. And we should all be a little bit romantic. Ideals can be a great thing. But the challenge with living for ideals alone is that history is replete with romantic ideals that are twisted by sin. Communism, for example, was really originally a romantic idea. Here it is. Wouldn't it be great if everyone was valued the same, if no job was considered more important than the other, and therefore everybody would get paid the same? I mean, that sounds great, except for the reality of a sinful human nature, which twisted that ideal both in how it was obtained and in how it was maintained. And in case you think capitalism can't be warped by sin... We should remember the words of Gordon Gekko, who said, greed is good. Anarchists live for this ideal of individual freedom. Well, that sounds like a romantic ideal. Yeah, it was so romantic for them that it was worth killing a U.S. president over and starting World War I. Some of the most idealistic people can also be some of the meanest, most condescending people you'll ever meet. Your ideals will let you down because you'll get in the way. It doesn't make ideals bad. We should all have ideals. It just means that you have to be suspicious of you in the pursuit of those ideals. Number four. Four, there we go. The fourth answer to the question, why am I here, is family. It's your ring finger. There's your, your, uh, your family idea. I was uh, watching the season opener of... Dancing with the Stars, because I'm awesome, last Monday, uh, when I heard Nick Lachey's wife, Nick Lachey and his wife were on Dancing with the Stars. If you don't know who they are, that's okay. Um, but she said over and over again that she, and this is a direct quote, lived for her children and her husband. In Naperville, we have a lot of parents living for their children. And we have a few children living for their parents, but not that many. Well, there's three big issues here as well when you just start living for family. First, in three generations, no one, gonna, no one is going to remember your name. I mean, name your great-great-great-great-grandmother. So, what exactly are you living for? Second, you're placing a tremendous burden on someone else to carry your existence on their backs along with their own. I mean, how would you like it if your parents did that to you? I just, I live for you. And then what happens when they walk out the door? Well, there goes your meaning, and all you're left with is annoying phone calls and text messages. Finally, when you say you're living for your family, what exactly are you hoping for here? I mean, how do you define family success? What gives your life meaning in the way that they live their lives? Is it their occupation? Is it that they don't screw up their marriages? I mean, what is it exactly that you're going for? So family members get taken for granted. They get ignored or even abused in this scenario. You know, parents become needy and children start to believe that the universe in the form of their parents exists to make their life easy. The fifth answer, of course, is God. It's God. Of course it's God. We're in church. It has to be God. So let me give you the person the person to focus on as we look at how God answers the question, why am I alive? Okay, we moved on from purposes. We're going to look at the person. Here's what Acts chapter 13 has to say about David. We started in 1 Chronicles. This was David speaking, so it makes sense to look at David. Acts chapter 13 and verse 22. He, who is God, raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 36, it says, For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep. Now, he don't mean literally fell asleep. It's a nice way of saying he died. David was a man after God's own heart, and he served the purpose of God. That sounds great. Now, here's the question. This is what I wonder. Which purpose of God did David fulfill? You know, David's led a pretty extraordinary life, right? When we think of the purpose of God, we think of many things. David and Goliath. Maybe was that his purpose? David being elected king. 
Was that his purpose? David uniting the tribes and defeating the enemies. David bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. David writing the Psalms, which brings comfort to you and I even to this day. Or is it here in 1 Chronicles 29 where David is gathering up the materials for the temple for which his son is going to go on and build? Oh, and by the way, in David's life, there's a lot more milestones than those. So, which purpose of God did David fulfill? Well, the passage helps us understand. I'm still on my P's. The passage helps us understand. David is actually at the end of his life when we get to this uh, text. He's been through a lot. If you go back and you look at verses 14 through 16, you'll see something interesting. Look at this. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? He's talking, he's at the end of his life. He's looking back. For all things have come from you, and of your own we have given you. For we are strangers before you, and sojourners as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow, and there is no abiding. O Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. I know, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness, purity, right, integrity. In the uprightness of my heart, which David hasn't always had, but he's a man after God's own heart, I have freely offered all these things. And now I have seen your people who are present here offering freely and joyously to you. So David recognizes here that God has to do the providing, right? What does he say? He says, all things have come from you, and of your own we have given you. And he recognizes that there is a journey involved. He calls the people of God what? Sojourners as all our fathers were. Everyone is on a journey. Everyone's in process. Then he says something about how they behave. And it's in that context that he sees that God would, and this is in verse 18, keep forever such purposes. What David knows is this. David knows that God reveals his purposes over time. David knows that with God, it's always purpose by revelation. Purpose by revelation. Now, we typically want God to tell us our purpose all at once. But God rarely does that. He'll usually tell us why we're alive one step at a time. So David was fulfilling God's purpose as he beats Goliath, which was big for the nation of Israel. All the way until the end of his life, he's been faithful to yet another purpose God has for him, which is gathering the materials for the construction of the temple. God reveals his purposes over time for those who would follow him. He answers the question, why am I alive piece by piece? And God's purpose for us is revealed through his personal word and his written word. It's always in the context of our relationship with him. Listen to this from Romans 8 and verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, there's a relationship, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Isaiah chapter 46, when God is saying that he's God and that from ancient times he's established his purposes, then right after that he says, listen to me, you stubborn of heart. God actually knows whose heart is stubborn. It's personal. He cares about you. So God is a God who speaks with us personally of his own free will, which we looked at last week. And it's in the context of his personal relationship with him that his purposes are established. Now his purposes are also revealed through scripture. It's, um, it's interesting to note that in Romans chapter 8, uh, Paul looks back at scripture. And even in 1 Chronicles 29, I don't know if you picked up on this, did you notice that David keeps referring back to the grand narrative of God? He says, Abraham, our fathers, Israel. He keeps going back, like the grand narrative, right? He understands this idea that God is revealing himself by his written word as, as well. Ask the Davises, the Kalps, the Bernhards, the DeSantos, and others who have walked with the Lord for many years. And they'll testify to this principle. Most of what they know wasn't born out of a grand plan that was revealed to them in the beginning. But it was born out over time. 
as they pay attention, attention and focus on God. And by the way, that's what glorify means, right? You pay attention and focus on God. We know glory best by love. We talked about this last week and how glory is, and love is how glory is revealed and understood. And this is why our passage, in our passage, the person of David starts the assembly with this massive expression of love for God. So it's important then to understand the process of discovering the answer to why am I here? So, so we can get the sequence of questions right. Now typically, here's what we want to know. I'm going to guess. I'm going to pretend that I, I think I know what you would typically say, which is you would start with what am I supposed to do? Where am I supposed to do it? Why am I supposed to do it? How am I going to do it? And who am I going to do it with? Does that sound pretty familiar to you? God, tell me what I'm supposed to do, where I'm supposed to do it, why I'm supposed to do it, how I'm going to do it, and who I'm going to do it with. But this is completely the wrong order. And it's no wonder we get the answer wrong to the question, why am I alive? Biblically, biblically now, the question starts with who? The question starts with who? The answer, of course, is it starts with God. My relationship and love for God are primary. In the light of the who, you'll find the answer to the question, why? If, uh, if I was to uh, walk in on a guy sitting with his wife on a sofa watching Downton Abbey and ask him, why are you watching Downton Abbey? His answer is likely to be, because I love her. It's got nothing to do with Downton Abbey and it's got everything to do with the girl. Now sometimes we can't understand the why. And the answer we rely on is, because he said so, and I love him. Now, is that enough? You know, if we love him, yes. Sometimes because I said so, kids, it's a pretty good answer. And adults, something that we have to learn. So the next question then becomes how? How? Notice what David does in verse 17. Did you notice what he does here? He, he takes the focus... And suddenly he's talking about the how. Look at verse 17. I know, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in what? Uprightness. You have pleasure in how we're doing this. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things, and now I have seen your people who are present here offering freely, not under obligation, not because they have to, but notice the how, they're motivated, they want to do it, and joyously to you. Joyously. Now, this is not accidental. David focuses on how they behave. They did it freely. They did it uprightly or with pure hearts. They're bringing the offering with integrity. Now listen to me. How someone behaves often opens up new opportunities. If someone behaves with integrity in the small things, they tend to get rewarded with bigger things. If you do a great job but with a negative attitude, then it's not all that likely that you'll get hired for the next job. Why? Because how we do things matter to the purposes and the opportunities or roads that open up in front of us. What impressed God the most about David? It's not that David did a bunch of stuff and he did a lot of really cool stuff, but it's that he was a man after God's own heart, which is a heart of being, not of doing, or not only of doing. Jesus reiterates this to his disciples over and over again. Paul hammers this point home in his letters, talking about the importance of the fruit that we bear, which is always related to the how we do things and not the what. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you're an angry rebel. You're James Dean. You're a rebel without a clue, right? Whatever it is. And the how is going to tell you, why am I here? I'm here to be an angry rebel. It's going to tell you a lot about your next steps. So first, you have to see what the Bible says about anger. Why? Well, because of the who. And once you see the why, knowing that it displeases the who, you change it. You decide you're not going to be an angry person. Then you ask the question, well, a rebel from what? 
If your answer is a rebel from my parents or a rebel from my boss or a rebel against the man, you know, which would be Caesar or government, whatever it is, then you search scripture to see what it says about the how. How am I supposed to treat my parents? How am I supposed to treat my boss? How am I supposed to treat the man? How am I supposed to treat Caesar? If your conclusion then is that you can rebel against a sinful system, then congratulations, you've got a green light to be a rebel. Welcome to the insurrection. Jesus began 2,000 years ago. The final two questions then are where and what. And of the two, where is more important than the what? Where is more important than the what? Jesus tells us to go first, and then he tells us what we're going to do. God sends out Abraham from Ur, and then later on comes the covenant of the land. Now, here's why it matters. By focusing on what uh, God wants you to be, you'll find the path where he wants you to be. You'll find the path toward the what opportunities, which may, in fact, have a profound impact on your future. For example, if you like sculpting and you focus on what first, you'll look around and you'll ask the question, well, everybody who sculpts, where do they go? And you may come to the conclusion that you should go to Rome. Why? Because your what has driven your where. But God's where for you might actually be different than that. You may pray, and if you're praying where first, then God may say, right here. So the courses that you take, the commitment that you show, the type of learning you receive may not be as convenient, but it will be important for your future. You know, God's where for David was at one point the cave of Adullam. When Absalom came for David in Jerusalem, God's where was first to move David outside of the city. Now, left to his own preferences, David probably wanted to stay in Jerusalem, but God called him away from it. Why? Because God ultimately wanted the victory over Absalom, and David needed to get out of the city in order to have it. You know, when Moses asked where, God told him to get back to Egypt. We all know the story. But if Moses had first asked what, he would have come up with a different plan. I know that. I would have come up with a different plan. He'd have warmed Pharaoh by pigeon courier right? I don't have to be in Egypt to warn Pharaoh. I can send somebody else. I can do something else. But the where mattered. And at the very end of all of that is the what, which I know, I know it sounds unfair. But understand that in the adventure for you, the adventure God has for you, your what now might change many times. But God's purposes for your life, which he reveals as you demonstrate that you love him, who's the who, seeking to understand but obeying him first, which is the why, and doing it with the uprightness, which is the how, will take you to places, which is the where, and ultimately will give you a life, which is the what, that is full of purpose and meaning. So, the order matters. Look at these two lists. We go from what, where, why, and how, to who, why, how, where, and what. Who? God gets the glory in the assembly. Why? Because we love him and we adore him personally. How? With upright hearts, joyfully and freely. Not because we're obliged, but because we want to. It's free. Where? Well, they're doing it in Jerusalem. They're sojourners. He's led them there. To do what? Now we're to build the temple. And so we can come to a definition to our question this morning. Here it is. You ready? I am here to follow God anywhere at any time, reflecting his attitudes and actions as he uses me uniquely to change the world in which he's placed me. I am here to follow God anywhere at any time, reflecting his attitudes and actions as he uses me uniquely. There's only one of you. He loves you uniquely, we covered that last week, to change the world in which he's placed me. God has placed you here for his purposes. David has lived a long and meaningful life. He's accomplished, his, he's accomplished God's purposes for his life, as Acts 13, right? Which were much bigger than anything he could have dreamed of. You know, David thought he would be the court musician forever. That was his plan for his life. And he lived that life with a heart that loved God, recognizing when he was wrong and ending, though, upright. 
That's why he's a man after God's own heart. So David does what here? Well, he ends the assembly, verse 20. He ends the assembly by telling the people to bless the Lord, which in this context means they told God how much he meant that he reigned, and the result was them bowing their lives before him. All of this was happening with construction materials everywhere. Think about meeting here with just construction materials everywhere. They're sojourners. They're en route to the purposes God have, has for them. That's a beautiful picture of the meaning of life. So what do we cover? Purpose, God, person, David, passage, first chronicles, and process. Who, why, how, where, what? Now, we're left with some principles to answer this present, this question for us this morning. And I'm going to go through these briefly because remember, I'm still thinking around 30 minutes. Here we go. Number one. Number one, trust and praise God that he has a purpose for your life, which he will reveal over time. Trust and praise God that he has a purpose for your life, which he will reveal over time. Last week, we looked at Bill Bright's first step as ensuring faith. God loves you. But the second part of that first step is God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. All of this is working out his plan for us, as opposed to bringing our plan to him. Number two, pursue becoming a man or a woman after God's own heart. So you've got to believe deep down that he's absolutely worth it. See, this should be your first pursuit. When people look at me, do I reflect Jesus? You've got to believe that deep down. Why? Because the juice has to be worth the squeeze, and life will squeeze you. Life will squeeze you. Number three, work on your how. Work on your how. Your opportunities in life are often related to your characteristics. They're related to your character. Character matters. I say it over and over again, but it does, especially biblically. Number four, God has you where you are for a reason. You know, caves are often temporary. But even a cave has a purpose if God has led you there. Number five. What you do may change over time depending on God's purposes for you in your generation. So don't lock yourself in. Don't hold on to what you think you are too tightly. God may have other plans for you. I'll close with this story and then we'll be done. In uh, World War II, there were some prisoners in a Nazi concentration camp in Hungary. They worked in a factory that processed human sewage. One day the Allies came and they bombed this factory which left the workers with nothing to do. So the German prison guards, or the Hungarian prison guards, had to figure out how to manage these prisoners. And so they had them move the rubble to a nearby field just so they would have something to do. The next day, they ordered them to take the rubble and move it back to the original spot. The next day, they reversed it. And they just did this over and over and over again. There was no meaning to it. There was no purpose. Just work without meaning. And then an amazing thing began to happen. You know, if you're a prisoner in World War II, that's a pretty dark place, right? It's pretty atrocious circumstances. If you're a prisoner working on human sewage, it's not a great place. But this amazing thing began to happen, and that is things got even worse. Things got even worse, just when you thought they couldn't. The prisoners began to go crazy. They lost hope. Many of them lost their minds. They began to throw themselves in front of the prison guards in order to be shot, committing suicide, because death was more preferable than living a life without meaning. Now, for a lot of people, this is the way that they live life. Go to school, work, and die. Even if they're not physically dead, they're dead on the inside. Because life has nothing to fill that empty void inside of them that cries out for significance and meaning. I can tell you I was there. God has something better purposed for us. If only we'll give up control to Jesus and we'll choose to follow him wholeheartedly. Now, what about you? Which of these questions do you need to work on? Maybe you've been going through this morning like, oh, Derek, I got the order switched. Like I, uh. some of you are 
kind of figuring out God and you're like, he has a purpose for me. He has a, he's designed me for purpose. He has something that in store for me. Yes. What is it? Wrong question. Who is it? You'll get to your what. Start with the who. Derek, I've been a follower. I get the, I buy into the who. I, I sometimes buy into the why. It depends on what he's asking me to do. I, I forgot about the how. I keep giving him my plans. And it feels like he's not there. Really, I told him what I want for the where. I'll go anywhere but there. Or I'm desperate to get out of here. And God is saying, here is where I want you. 